Hi, my name is Nia Faye Kirtan. I am a grad student at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. Um, I am in the mental health counseling clinical program and my main focus is athletes. So this documentary is about 12 athletes who are going to talk about how or if social anxiety is enhanced by all-star cheerleading. Um, in this documentary, I want you to please be aware that these athletes are being vulnerable and they're being honest and they're being open and they chose to do so. So please be kind because they are humans and they didn't have to do this. I chose to do athletes or focus on athletes for my mental health career, current and former, because I feel like a lot of times athletes' mental health is devalued. It's always about their physical being or what they can bring to the table, what they can bring to the program, what's bringing the money. It's never ever about their emotional and mental well-being. And so I feel like choosing a sport to start off with that I hold near and dear to my heart and like how I could have seen the negative effects on myself and taking these 12 athletes and letting them share their story would allow me to let you guys see a sport that A, is not really considered a sport um, because it's very undervalued and B, allow you guys to see that they do go through some real stuff and it doesn't only affect them while they're doing it, but also when they're done. So you have six current and you have six former and you're going to see the difference between the two. Without further ado, this is Mental Block. My name is Ryan Cummings. I am 17 years old. I am a senior. I am a current cheerleader and I have been cheering for 14 years. Hi, I'm Emma Thomas. I'm 16. I'm a junior in high school. I am still currently cheering and I am on a level 6 cheer team and I've been cheering for 13 years. Hi, my name is Cassidy Childs. I'm 22. I'm a senior in college. I cheered for 8 years and I'm a former competitive cheerleader. My name is Jayla and I am 21 years old. I go to Clemson University and I'm a former All-Star cheerleader for 13 years. I'm Gabby Brown and I'm 19 years old. I'm a current cheerleader and I'm a sophomore in college. Oh, and I've been cheering for 12 years. Hi, I'm McKenna. I'm 17 years old. I'm a senior in high school. I'm a current cheerleader and I've been cheering for 15 years. Hi, I'm Anna Rimmel. I'm a senior in high school. I'm 17 years old. I'm a current cheerleader and have been for the past 12 years. Hi, my name is Madison Peoples. I'm a senior in high school and I've been cheering since I was five. Hi, my name is Kendi Harris. I'm 23 years old. I'm a recent graduate of the illustrious Winston-Salem State University. I'm a former cheerleader and I've cheered for 10 years. So the first question that I asked these athletes was to see if they knew what social anxiety was. So I wanted them to give their informed opinion on what they thought it was. Um, I wanted to see if they were aware. I wanted to see if the competitive sport that the current athletes were in, if they were really able to notice these symptoms and these signs. And I wanted to see if the former athletes were aware because they realized that this sport really did enhance a lot of the symptoms that they are experiencing now. I feel like social anxiety is whenever you are put in certain situations and you feel like super uncomfortable in them or like you feel like everybody's like watching you. Um, I think it's like, it's when you're like scared, like you're fine when you're just with your friends, but like as soon as you're with somebody that you, you're not comfortable with, you like, you like tense up and mm -hmm. you can't really like say what you'd want to say. Mm -hmm. And I think like in cheer, like it's really bad, like at like competition and stuff, like you're expected to like be nice to everybody, like mm -hmm. act like it's like everything's like fine, but mm -hmm. like you know, it's hard to like talk to people that you don't know. Mm -hmm. And like everyone's watching you, so it's like hard to mm -hmm. try to be perfect when it's not perfect all the time. Mm -hmm. I think that social anxiety is pressures and and like, I don't know, it, it, anxiety that you feel socially due to like the environment you're in. So in cheerleading, so like social anxiety for me 
would be walking into practice like late or something and then having everyone staring at you or mm -hmm. wearing the wrong thing to practice mm -hmm. and then you know you're that one person out that one awkward person and it's just a lot of pressure mm -hmm. everything just comes too much it becomes too much mm -hmm. um the stress of having to do a certain thing or compete at a certain competition mm -hmm. it kind of takes an impact on you and it's it's just almost like worse than regular anxiety because mm -hmm. you can be anxious in a normal situation and be like nervous for something but with social anxiety and cheerleading it's almost like a whole burden is pushed on you and forced on you and it's it's sometimes it's really difficult to hard like deal with right. until it's over right i think that i have social anxiety because of the big following that i have created and Everybody's gonna have an opinion about me, but now these days, because of social media, they just have the right to say whatever they want anonymously, whenever they want, however they want, no filter. They just say what they need to say, and then I'm just supposed to take it. Cheerleading kind of sparked like a lot of internal um, self awareness things that maybe, or like self consciousness that I kind of like worried a lot about, and I feel like that plays a lot of parts into social aware uh, or social anxiety. Um, and even like me growing up as an only child to like be around like a whole bunch of other people um, That was like always my place to go to was like all-star cheer because I didn't have siblings at home. So I think like um, As a cheerleader having social anxiety and being taken away from your home, but then like being put in a place that kind of caused it um, It was interesting, but that's kind of like the role that it's played in my life now that I like look back on it um, I feel like being a cheerleader, you're constantly watched all the time. Like, mm -hmm. People are always ha like always have their eye, always have something to say. Mm -hmm. So like if I'm giving a class presentation or something like that, and I'm up there, I feel like everybody's thinking the worst of me and like uh, like judging me more than they probably are, just because in the cheer world you get judged. Mm -hmm. My coaches were very high-strung people, very loud people, and it it kind of just already influenced me to be kind of even more anxious than I am as a person. Mm -hmm. And as I grew up throughout the sport, it it's just almost, it's gotten worse with social media involved in it and just kind of moving my whole life down here. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's made me put almost a burden on myself mm -hmm. and having to like live up to something, mm -hmm. it just makes makes it all worse. It is definitely upsetting to hear that these young athletes have experienced social anxiety um, at such a young age. They have put their time and their money and really their blood, sweat, and tears into a sport that they're passionate about just to be almost negatively affected. Um, you'll see that these athletes have experienced hate on social media, um, trouble from coaches and peers and even some family members you'll see body image issues, you'll see some have a routine that they even stick with to this day to just get out of the house. You'll see um, people talk about their perfectionism and how that's carried over to this day or how that affects them in social settings. Um, you'll also see a little bit about race and how that's impacted some of these athletes now. It's emotional, it's raw, and it can be very triggering. Hi, my name is Kaylee Wilkerson. I'm 23 years old. I went I'm a former cheerleader and I cheered for 12 years. Well, I think, um, you know, I think it's very obvious to say, you know, the, the example for a cheerleader, you know, the type of person that you think about when you think of a cheerleader. It's the, you know, cute little blonde girl with the abs and the sports bra and sports bras, you know, comfortable in her body, fit, nice butt, nice arms, you know what I mean. Um, and I think that was very much so what we were kind of driven to look like. And if you didn't look like that perfect little teeny tiny, tiny, tiny uh, Barbie cheerleader doll, you know, then it was, you weren't necessarily flat out shamed, but there was just little things here and there, like always having to match in our sports brawls and spandex. And a few people, personally, I didn't want to get my my shirt off because I wasn't comfortable. I always thought that I'd never look like anyone else. And then your eating disorder, which you said that you shared on social media, yes. which takes a lot. Mm -hmm. What, did cheer feel that or was it? Um, actually it did. I didn't really say it because it was like, whatever. But 
Um, I never really, I didn't take cheer seriously until I moved here for cheer. Mm -hmm. And then once I started taking it seriously, I was like, I'm scared that people are going to like say something because like I don't look like everybody else is like on the team. So mm -hmm. then I just like, I don't know, like I just kind of started like, fought, like stopped eating and stuff and then it like ended up being like a whole thing. Like I didn't think it would ever end up like that obviously, but, mm -hmm. and then I don't know, like one day I just, it was like New Year's Day actually. I just mm -hmm. stopped and then after that it was just, it just kept going and mm -hmm. I don't know. Was it a, like a physique thing that you felt like you had to fit because of cheerleading? Yeah, for sure. Because, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, like when I was like younger, like it was like, uh, I don't know, like it was like cheer athletics and stuff. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you always like looked at cheetahs and stuff and mm -hmm. you saw like the tiny people and like, mm -hmm. and I felt like I had to like match that to become like, to be like on a good team, like to mm -hmm. match the people on a good team. Mm -hmm. For me, every time I look in the mirror, I like always, I never notice like my hair looks good or like, mm -hmm. like I look good. I'm always like, oh, I could be smaller and stuff like that. But then I'm like, it's cheerleading at the end of the day, like mm -hmm. it's cheerleading. So I'm not going to change it. And there, and you always compare yourself to like the smaller flyers and like the little people who are on teams who have like abs, but have had puberty and stuff like that. Like you just pay attention to that stuff and like mm -hmm. how you used to be and then how your body's like changed and mm -hmm. becoming more of a woman. Body image and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I definitely think that it's something that I struggle with for the longest time, like just accepting myself for who I am or accepting my body for who I am. Um, and also I just think like whenever we're younger, we don't understand that like our bodies are changing. Like we're mm -hmm. becoming from like little girls to like, or like little ladies to like young women and our bodies change, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's not something that we're really prepared for as like flyers or as like young girls growing up through our sport. You grow up, you grow up fast. I'm 5'8", which in outside of the cheer world, that's not really a big deal, you're 5'8". Mm -hmm. It's like, it's kind of actually cool. Like I see girls all the time on social media be like, oh, I wish I was your height, I wish I was your size. But like, whenever you get into the cheer world, you're always told that you're too big to fly, you're too tall, you can't do this, you can't do that. But like, I'm too tall to fly, but I'm not big enough to base. So like, what am I good for? Do you think that like your mental health or your teammates mental health was like really prioritized during the time that you were cheering? Definitely not. Um, the team, this particular team, and honestly cheerleading in general is all about perfection. Um, if you're not perfect, then you're doing something wrong. So our mental health was not taken into account. If you were perfect, that was bad. If you weren't perfect, that was bad. That that was just period, point blank. So um, that comes to the point of people being upset about their bodies, being upset about um, their performance. Being, like It's just a whole multitude of things that like you're taught perfection is it and that's all that you need to do. But um, nobody takes into account how much mental stability is messed up in this whole situation of cheer. Growing up in cheer, you don't see a lot of black girls. And and if you do see, you don't see a lot of really good black girls or you don't see a little like black girls that are praised or mm -hmm. people love them, you know, or they're the center of the routine or so, I mean, I used to not want to wear my hair. Like I wouldn't want to go to practice unless my hair was done a so, set like if I had my natural hair out it wasn't like I wasn't down with that going to practice with that like if it was I don't know I just wanted to be I don't know like I just wanted to be like them like be like the like, okay yeah the white girls yeah, yeah the white girls like I didn't I didn't know that I was beautiful like I didn't I wanted to be like that I want my hair to be like that I wanted mm -hmm. it to so I wanted my skin to look like that. I wanted my body to be shaped like theirs. So I think that's where, yeah, the peer influence mm -hmm. was for me, yeah. You were the first black flyer, basically. Something like that, yeah. Point At least flyer. on the new age of point, point flyer. Yeah, for sure. First black point flyer on the team. Mm -hmm. You don't see many black flyers, period. period. <laughs> and you don't see many black women or young ladies in the sport 
anymore, but even at that time. At our caliber, the way that we were. Right. The level, the intensity, none of that. What pressure mentally was that for you? Um, I think that, like, knowing who came before me mm-hmm. and, like, coming to that role, one, I felt really grateful to be in the position mm-hmm. to for, for a coach and for, you know, my peers to feel like I'm the person who could hold that position. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that in the end it did make me – it made me feel like I failed in a sense whenever we didn't win Worlds, like, in 2015. Like, I felt like I was, like, supposed to be that point flyer who kind of, like, carried us there, mm-hmm. and I feel like – in some ways, like, I'm the one who failed us because I was that girl. And I did make a couple mistakes. And, like, but throughout the years, I've kind of realized who gave me the confidence to be, you know, better. Even whenever I was point, I was getting kind of, like, threatened to be taken out of point. Mm-hmm. Um, to be somebody else to be put in my position. And, Take yeah, I would hate to say that certain things weren't the way that they were because I was black but sometimes you can can yeah take your time saying that yeah no sometimes it's hard to think like of it any other way um I think that it's obvious that people who look different than me who were white they got different praise than I did and I never again like I said I never felt that love a hundred percent the way that those girls did or the way that the people who came before me, or even the people who came after me, the way that they got. Um, And I honestly think like that really hurt my feelings. And then for us to like lose that year, it just like, just sucked even more because I felt like I couldn't bring that for us. And like, that was the the one thing that I could have done to like make it all seem like, okay, like she made the right decision or whomever put me in this position like made the right decision. Mm -hmm. So I think like, it was a huge weight for me. And I don't even think I performed that great that year. I think I fell a lot. <laughs> I think I fell at a couple of competitions just because how was I supposed to how was I supposed to perform good or like yeah. have that confidence when nobody believed in me? My top two worst things that have been said about me on social media were that I was sexually assaulted and was pregnant by the person who apparently sexually assaulted me. And that I fell out of competition on my head, got sent to the hospital, I had a concussion, and people said that they wished that I had died or got paralyzed from falling out of a prep. So I think those are the two biggest things that people have said about me. Or that, just really just to die. <laughs> but what platform was on? Twitter. Okay. And how has that affected you? Both of those uh, comments. Well, the first one was very extreme. I was, I was, I think I was only like, 15, nearly 15 at the time. So, like, that was, like, I barely even, like, talked about that. Like, you don't really hear about that stuff. And that never happened to me. And, like, it got to the point where my mom had to ask me, like, did this happen? And I was, like, no. And it was just really hard for, like, every... It was, like, kind of embarrassing in a way. Because, like, I don't know. Like, that's, like, a really big thing and not something to joke about. And, like, if you're going... Like, you have to be a really sick person in my head to joke about something like that. Uh, like yeah. that's a real thing that people suffer with. I'm Vanessa Torres, I'm 23 years old, I'm a former cheerleader of 11 years, and I went to UNCG. As we know, her sister, Ryan Cummins, was on the documentary as well. What is the difference between the two worlds that you see as far as you being her sister and supporting her on the side? Um. Now, being on the outside of that, and just to kind of be somebody that's watching, Mm -hmm. it happen directly to somebody that I love and care about, it's really, it's, it's just, it's one thing to be in it, but then to actually really just see how toxic it is. And to be in a mature state of mind Mm -hmm. and to have grown and to have more life experience, I look, I have a different perspective on cheerleading. Mm -hmm. (sighs) What people don't understand is that it's one thing to have 
a couple thousand followers mm -hmm. and to get hate. Mm -hmm. Ryan has a half a million followers mm -hmm. and to receive the amount of backlash just on a daily basis and to feel like you're under a microscope at all times, mm -hmm. it's heartbreaking to watch. Also kind of overwhelming because everybody always has like my pictures and knows what I'm doing and like like small things like what clothes I'm wearing, where they're from, how much they are, like it mm -hmm. just like it's like kind of weird mm -hmm. and that they just know everything about me and sometimes they like try to say things about me that I don't even know about myself. And social media, never experienced it to the degree that I did when I moved here. So those two components have just never been in my life until mm -hmm. now and definitely made it, my, my anxiety just sometimes just go through the roof mm -hmm. and it was just terrible. Okay, so how does social media impact you now with your social anxiety? I, I've learned that I've had to kind of grow a little bit of self-confidence and know that I made the team mm -hmm. and these people on social media haven't mm -hmm. and they're hiding behind a screen because there's no way that they would you know hop on a live stream and say it to my face mm -hmm. or call me and say it to my face right. so I just had to accept the fact that people are never going to be satisfied with what I do what I choose to do mm -hmm. with my life or what I'm doing in cheerleading and I just have to kind of be proud of myself mm -hmm. and just block those people out right. So if you feel free to share, what was the worst thing said about you on social media? Um, probably when I first moved down here, uh, I was in and out with this other flyer, mm -hmm. and this other flyer is an amazing tumbler. Mm -hmm. She's an ama amazing person, amazing. She's a great flyer as mm -hmm. well. But I had to fight to even have half of it, like a stunt. So mm -hmm. people on social media would. I remember. I remember my first year on the team. I. I wasn't, I didn't have the best group. My group was like all a bunch of stragglers put together and we like had to work it out. We were the, we were the worst group and mm -hmm. we finally like hit a stunt circle and I was so excited. I was like, I'm going to post it. I, I can't wait to like show the world that, you know, what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I posted it and I remember going on Twitter like the next morning or something and there was a thread of screenshots of me, just people critique, like not even, just gosh they just okay. they, they posted screenshots of me and all those like it wasn't my best but mm -hmm. you know I was excited to post it and it kind of just ruined it for me mm -hmm. and multiple anonymous accounts would just comment under the thread and just make it worse and worse all just how bad of a flyer I was how the other flyer should be in the air over me how they don't even know how I made the team and that that took a that took a big toll as well mm -hmm. on me how did that affect you moving forward I, I was almost angry like I wanted I wanted to prove all these people wrong but I was also confused because I was like what have I ever done to any of these people mm -hmm. for them to come on a social media platform and just speak so terribly about me mm -hmm. like I, what did I do to deserve that because right. I would have never done that to someone so I and that's just I I was naive too I didn't mm -hmm. know really like what I was getting into mm -hmm. and I just knew that this was something I was gonna have to accept and no one's ever gonna be satisfied with what I do mm -hmm. but moving forward I just had to I deleted my Twitter deleted the app okay, wow. I, yeah I, I, I didn't want it in my life I didn't mm -hmm. want to see it I didn't I it, it's an app on my phone that I don't need mm -hmm. if people are just going to talk bad about me and I'm going to go back and refresh it to see more bad things said about me mm -hmm. so I just deleted it and just worked on stretching more mm -hmm. and just being better in the air and coming in the gym more and mm -hmm. just being a better athlete right as these girls begin their journey into cheerleading, they realize the physical and emotional toll that it's taking on their well-being. Um, a lot of these people saw or felt like the gym was a second home for them, while others just simply missed the mark. Honestly, probably at practice. Okay. Um, personally, I guess like before, I guess it was like the transition into like the bigger cheer gym name I came from like a small gym in my like small little town that I came from and we would drive you know a really long way like an hour or so to drive to the gym that we went to then um which was like a big big difference than where I came from so I think like 
being at a place of that stature it was something that you know you were held to a high standard mm -hmm. and because of that I think that it caused again a lot of social anxiety to the point where like my mom couldn't come to practice she was not allowed to come to practice like nope you can't come today I would leave my first year kind of like throughout that big gym mm -hmm. I was like I leave practice every single day crying and then be like mom I didn't cry that much today every single practice and then finally I came home and I was like I didn't cry at all today and it was like the biggest deal for me like whatever that day happened mm -hmm. and competing though competing was like the one time where like none of it mattered like mm -hmm. where it was just two minutes and 30 seconds and it didn't matter that my stomach hurt whenever I'd pull into the gym parking lot mm -hmm. um and that like or I don't know just like those little things that always like made it seem like it wasn't worth it like competing was always like that one thing that was like worth it for me like that those two minutes and 30 seconds that I got to just like boom be myself so I think that practice definitely was like the one that caused a lot of anxiety especially when my mom couldn't come or like mm -hmm. just little things within I don't know throughout because we spent so much time there I spent so much time there and yeah you were in there for two hours and 30 minutes minimum mm -hmm. just your team coaches practicing there is so many times in so many areas of opportunity to mess up, mm -hmm. um, to not hit a skill, to drop a stunt, and I mean, it's just all eyes on you. So practice, every practice, I feel like I never walked in comfortable. Something that was actually traumatizing to me is um, what's said to everybody is that everybody's replaceable. So um, me in particular, I had four concussions um, while I was cheering, um, but I continue to cheer through those concussions because I always thought, oh, the next person is coming to take my spot. So um, I always thought that I needed to be out on the floor no matter how I was feeling. I had some broken fingers. Um, of course, like I said, I had four concussions, but I didn't want to leave the floor because I was always told, like, there's somebody else that can do what you're doing. Um, oftentimes, there was somebody sitting at the front of the floor waiting to be the next person to be put in. Um, she would have a main base, a secondary base, a back spot, a front spot, a flyer. She'd have everybody out there ready to jump in. So you even saying that you something is hurting, I could tear my ACL. All right, the next person coming. It is what it is, though. But, yeah, that is very traumatizing and yep. keep in mind that our parents are paying a lot a lot of money for us to cheer and for somebody to say that to me like everybody's replaceable wow my parents are paying all this money wow um, me actually wanting to be out on the floor that can be mentally draining there's this one choreographer mm -hmm. and he um, was so mean to me for yeah. some reason like I literally don't know what I did to him mm -hmm. but he um, he'd be like he was like, oh, yeah. He'd be like, oh, that back spot. Like, cause I'm like, I'm like in this certain spot for baskets, and yeah. I turned around and it was supposed to be motions, and he was like, oh, that back spot. Like, not uh, yeah. Mm, and he would like, he like clearly like made me upset. Like everybody was like, are you okay and stuff, and I was like, um, yeah, whatever. Like it's normal. I hate chor choreographers because they make me so scared. Cause I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't like get that stuff that quick. Mm -hmm. And so, um. For like the whole time that we were getting choreography, he was just mean to me. Like he literally would like call me out and he'd be like, um, if there was one mistake in this whole routine, it would be you. And like he was just very, <laughs> he was very mean to me. And then um, I was like, I finally said something. I was like, why are you like harassing me? Like what did I do? And he was like, um, maybe if you'd get these motions right, like if you could do one motion, then you'd be better. And I, be, and I like started crying and like. That like makes me like not want to like, like every, now every time a choreographer comes, I'm like I dread it until they're gone, and like they make me not want to do anything in the routine because I'm like I don't want to get yelled at just so just to do it. Like once you leave, I'm fine, but like when you're teaching it to me, like I don't like they just act like I don't know. Like I have to be perfect. Like we weren't allowed to be with our parents. Like if we we weren't allowed to venture off and be with like if we were to go let's say to Disney for like Worlds or UCA, we weren't allowed to go to the parks and be with your parents or other people from other teams. We were stuck with our teammates and we had zero say about. We would stay with our stunt groups and we weren't allowed to like 
branch off and mm -hmm. it was almost like I felt in at this facility that there was just this motive to kind of make clicks mm -hmm. and to kind of pin people against each other mm -hmm. and it was just a very shocking experience mm -hmm. to and that's what I mean by when I when I switched gyms it was night and day mm -hmm. it was one was like a free-for-all and the other was you wore khakis when you went on the plane when you travel to competition and you wore tennis shoes and you weren't allowed to wear whatever you wanted and we all had to look the same when we were having our phones taken away and we weren't allowed to be with our moms and our dads and it was just crazy. In order to feel some type of normalcy, environments that weren't cheerleading became mini vacations. Um, just having the weight of perfectionism taken off their shoulders for a little bit really potentially saved these athletes from having a breakdown. Unfortunately, these athletes were in environments where they struggled with perfectionism and being scrutinized. I feel like it's make no mistakes, like you should be perfect all the time, like you have these standards to hold and whenever you don't meet that standard then it's that you, they, people notice and they call you out on it and they tell you what you're doing wrong and how you're doing it wrong and that you need to just stop what you're doing and mm -hmm. move on and do other things and that you're not really talented and stuff like that so I feel mm -hmm. like just being I feel like I have to be perfect all the time and that like I can't make any mistakes and that there's no room for error mm -hmm. because that's I'll get somebody's gonna say something mm -hmm. how the coaches talk to us in comparison to relationships now um, we were very much, I feel like we were objects, very objective statements were always thrown our way. We were very much depersonalized, I think, to some extent, the coaches. Um, it was so easy for them to, you know, throw out a comment that they know would hurt you and then twist the knife, you know, add on something else. So I think... You know, definitely the way that we were spoken to day in and day out. You know, in a relationship, it's hard to mm -hmm. differentiate that that's not how you're supposed to be treated and spoken to. So I think it definitely, it was a, a huge learning curve to have to go from, you know, that type of coaching and being talked to and dialogue, you know, to a relationship when you realize, like, that's not how one should be treated. When we're asked at practice to be perfect all the time, that when we remove like the practice or the competition atmosphere and we go out into the real world, like that that doesn't really, like that switch doesn't really turn off sometimes. Mm -hmm. So like if you like have a conversation with someone and it doesn't kind of go the way that you see it, it's almost like my anxiety has increased because at practice I'm told I have to be perfect or I have to like condition or I have to do it again. Mm -hmm. So that's how it works in my brain. So the month leading up to Worlds was probably one of the hardest months of my life because I was on two different teams, one going to Summit and one going to Worlds. And the practices were just brutal. Like we had, I think once we had like a 10 hour practice, that, for that, that month before Worlds was just oh, the hardest month mm -hmm. of my life. Like having that 10 hour practice like on a Sunday, it was just, it was mentally draining and my body was like deteriorating. I had to go to, you know, a chiropractor and just get my back like adjusted. It was, it was so out of place and usually I've just learned to deal with pain mm -hmm. because there's no, oh my gosh, you rolled your ankle, go sit down, you're fine. Like, you I mean, go sit down, like, you can go home. No, it's, it's not like that. You really are not allowed to miss practice. You're not like allowed to be hurt. So all these things just like adding up over and over and over until like that last month like just made me explode yeah. and I had I, I had a hard time at Worlds because mm -hmm. I felt like I built this I built something up in my mind that I was working so hard for and I made so many sacrifices for that it almost ruined the experience right. for my for myself yeah you just always have to look perfect you have to seem perfect you have to be a leader you have to tell people what to do you have to be supportive of people you can never be in a bad mood like that's a big thing too I always get in trouble because like I'm not smiling at practice or I'm not telling people to be quiet or listen or 
like I'm not clapping and looking like I'm having the time of my life. Mm-hmm. But so you're not allowed to have a bad day. No. Do you feel like like are you afraid of your mental health when you're done? No, I'm gonna be great. <laughs> <laughs> I am so excited. Okay. After you get outside of cheerleading, you understand that there's a whole lot more mm-hmm. to life mm-hmm. than the world of cheerleading. It is very much a bubble. Mm -hmm. And when you're in that bubble, it feels like the only thing that exists and the only thing that's important. So I think when you break out of that bubble, you understand that there's more to life than worrying about Mm -hmm. cheerleading. The people that are going to be cheerleaders or that getting into cheerleading, put yourself first, always. Always put yourself first. You are enough and In order for this industry to become legit and for people to respect it, we have to respect ourselves and we have to respect the people in it. We have to take care of our minds, our brains, our bodies. Like, our mental health has to come before we care about what size we are. We have to care about us before we care about anything else. Okay, so I just wanted to say thank you guys for tuning in. It truly means a lot for your support. Um, I wanted to give a special thanks to my production team, Derek and Jamar. They really put their all into this with me and they helped me and they were able to give me constructive criticism throughout and really helped me bring this to life. Also, I want to thank God for laying this creativity piece on my heart so I could get this out there to you guys. I want to thank my support system, my best friends, my parents. Um, I just really am super thankful and I hope that you guys enjoyed this documentary and that it was informative and that you were really able to um, take something from it, whether you're an athlete or whether you're really thinking about joining this sport. So thanks, you guys.